Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to the July 27th edition of your NAACP Speaks. Heard here every Tuesday from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. on WEHA 88.7 and 100.3 FM. We salute William Hawks, our president and leader here at WHA, and our superb engineering staff of Kristen and Super Steph, who keeps us up and running. Uh, we thank you for taking time from your busy day to join us on this NAACP program and to hear our NAACP local programs and initiatives and our special guests. Our special guest tonight will be Reverend Roy L. Jones, who's really a native of Atlantic City and who's now active uh, in Camden City, Camden County, and this region as an environmental activist and an environmental organizer. Very, very important topic, Yolanda, and we're going to hear from him uh, in our five o'clock hour. We're so happy uh, to have him. As we do every week, uh, we mourn and uh, salute our citizens in New Jersey who have succumbed to COVID-19. And we note uh, with sadness uh, the passing of so many of our citizens across this country who have died from this disease. And we hope and pray uh, that COVID-19 is over sooner rather than later. And as always, we encourage people, we urge people to please get vaccinated, encourage your friends to get vaccinated, your family to get vaccinated, your coworkers to get vaccinated, your neighbors to get vaccinated. It's very important that we end uh, this scourge. Uh, I noticed that uh, the latest statistics show that New Jersey is very close to vaccinating 70% of our adults. And again, of course, we're reaching down to young, younger people and we encourage all of you to please get vaccinated. We're coming close to schools going back uh, and we need to make sure that everyone is vaccinated. Uh, we are encouraging people uh, to register to vote. And Yolanda talk about that more in the announcements. The NACP does not endorse candidates. We don't support candidates, but we do support the electoral system. We strongly urge everybody to vote. This is electoral. Uh, year, every year's election in, land, in uh, New Jersey, uh, but this year we're electing a governor, uh, we're electing uh, a state senate, we're electing the state assembly, which is our uh, upper and lower houses in the state legislature. Uh, we are electing uh, county commissioners. Uh, in Atlantic City, we're electing a mayor and three council people at large. Very, very important election. Uh, please register to vote. As we did last week, uh, we are again uh, congratulating our fellow uh, NACP member, uh, Ms. Joyce Molyneux, who's an Atlantic City resident, who was going to be on the Casino Control Commission. It's been a long while since we've had a local resident on the Casino Control Commission. We congratulate her. Uh, we salute her. We applaud her. We look for great things from Joyce Molyneux. We also, uh, as we did last week, uh, want to give a shout out to Mo Butler. Mo Butler is going to be the uh, chair. He is the chair already. He's been sworn in. He is the chair uh, for the Casino Reinvestment Development Authority, uh, better known as CREDA. And uh, we salute him, very accomplished gentleman, uh, very savvy uh, in urban development, a uh, former uh, chief of staff for Senator Bookler, Booker, and he's gonna be the first person of color who has been the chair of CRDA, and we salute Mo Butler. Also uh, coming this week, uh, the first, uh, Tuesday in August or August 3rd, our special guest will be Andrew Brooke. Andrew Brooke is the interim uh, attorney general for the state of New Jersey. Uh, he was with uh, the former attorney general, attorney general Graywall, uh, who uh, came down for our community walk uh, that we've been doing for several years in conjunction with uh, Yolanda Atlantic County for a safe, Atlantic County coalition, the Atlantic County coalition for a safe community headed by our beloved brother, Perry Mays. And uh, as Yolanda mentioned uh, last week, that made the front page of the paper. Uh, it was excellent coverage and, and, and I'm glad, uh, not so much because I was in the picture, but because it showed that we're trying to do things in the community uh, and that the NAACP is relevant and the NAACP is involved and active in uh, community betterment, uh, making a better relationship uh, with uh, the community in increasing lines of communication with law enforcement and the community and having uh, law enforcement 
uh, be available uh, when they're not making arrests, when they're not doing their official duties. And um, uh, Yolanda asked me to explain some of the things that the Community Walks does. The community Walks helps to build bridges of understanding between law enforcement and the community. Uh, the chief of police goes along with us. The prosecutor goes along with us. Uh, the mayor, council people, um, religious leaders, civic leaders uh, go along with us just to show the community that there's concern. Uh, we used to pass out candy. We don't do that anymore. Stockton encouraged us not to do that, and they were right, our Stockton. So, so we start passing out fruit. Uh, Vince Massio, who was our assembly person, uh, had been donating fruit, and I think he's going to do that again. We're going to find a way, Yolanda, uh, to make sure that we do that with the safety protocols, because I think we can have someone bag the fruit and put it in individual bags so we can hand it out. But we used to hand it out, uh, give the uh, youngsters an apple or orange, and uh, they were very receptive to that. But obviously, with COVID, we can't do it like that. But I think that we can uh, have people who are properly glo gloved and all uh, pack the uh, fruit handouts and hand out fruit. So I think we'll be doing that as, as we go forward. Um, thank you to uh, Vince Mazio uh, for helping us with the fruit, uh, Perry Mays for his uh, leadership uh, with the uh, coalition, working with us uh, on the community walks. Uh, as we do every week in the program, uh, we turn it over to our uh, executive program uh, producer, our co-host, uh, the vice president of the Atlantic City Branch and ACP, our legal redress officer, and as of a couple of months ago, crowned the queen of radio uh, by uh, Brother Alexander Bland, who's on vacation. But uh, I think it's sort of stuck. Yolanda, some of my barbershop associates, uh, they wanted to know uh, the uh, week that you had an engagement, uh, was that because you were crowned the queen and your uh, fee went to the roof that we couldn't afford? I said, well, we couldn't afford a fee before she became a queen, uh, but she just had a professional engagement because as everyone knows by now, uh, Yolanda, in addition to her many hats, is an attorney at law, uh, the first uh, woman of color who's a partner uh, in Cooper Levinson, attorneys at law here in Atlantic City. Without further ado, Yolanda, good afternoon. Good afternoon, President. And I hope you're still enjoying your birthday month as we continue on. This is your last Tuesday of the month. I Next hope you're you. enjoying it. It's a blessed one that you have a continuing, uh, uh, a continuing progression in your self-care, but also a prosperous rest of your year. I hope so. I'm so excited. As you know, uh, this is uh, the month of July 20. 21, and we are a year away from the National Convention, uh, which is going to be July 2022, 20, God willing, in person in Atlantic City. And I'm crossing off the days in anticipation. I think that uh, I'm going to try to do uh, my birthday celebration on the 17th of July, the 17th of August, and the 17th of September. That's my actual birthday. I think I'm going to try to take those days as uh, uh, mental health days with your permission, uh, Queen. And move forward like that, but it's important. Uh, we had Laverne Summers, if you if you remember, uh, Laverne Sanders, I'm sorry, Laverne Sanders, who was uh, one of our members who uh, talked about self-care and uh, how to deal with stress uh, in general, but particularly uh, during this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. And, and we um, tell our listeners to, to be attuned to those kind of things. Uh, we don't like to talk about mental health in communities of color, but it's an issue. It's important. Uh, Self-care is important. Uh, the signs of, of depression are important. And this has been such a traumatic experience, excuse me, not just for us, the whole world. Right. This is something uh, that we're going through and we need to talk about it. We need to be there for uh, each other. And as uh, Maisha Z said last week, uh, we need to listen to each other and encourage our young people and listen to our young people who are also going through stress. Everybody is going through stress and trauma in this period. We need to be attuned to that. And uh, we need to uh, make sure that we reach out and ask uh, about each other's uh, condition. Absolutely. Over the last year that we've been doing this COVID pandemic version of our show, mental health, right. self-care have come up so very often, almost at least once a month. 
right. where the guest speaker talks about the importance of self-care. So we cannot underscore the importance of that. I was um, so inspired by a few weeks ago with the community walk and that you had over 150 people attending mm. and that there were so many stakeholders and community members and the former attorney general was there. And I looked at the moment and said, wow, we hadn't had one of those in over a year. Right. And the importance of coalescing with one another, the, the panoply of multiculturalism and different walks of life and um, just being there to, to have the moment. And although we are still socially distanced, it still was a time to, to get together and really reflect on where, how far we've come, how many we've lost and where we're going in the future. And so I commend you and the uh, Coalition for a Safe Community in the City of Atlantic City for putting together that community walk because it was a beautiful reminder of, of the importance of community, but also it's, it's sobering because there's so many people who would have been there that were not there um, mm -hmm. over the last year. Absolutely. And, and also uh, 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 the interim uh, community, the interim uh, attorney general, Mr. Mm -hmm. Brock was very impressed uh, with uh, the people who came out with the response, uh, uh, he gravitated to the children as, as we all do. The children were lovely uh, in the on the walk, and uh, I want to thank you too, Yolanda, uh, for presenting uh, the outgoing Attorney General uh, with our uh, a branch resolution and the plaque. Uh, very very well done. Uh, he appreciated it. Uh, as I said last week on the show, uh, he reached out to me and said he has a special place in his heart. For Lang City, in fact, he told a joke. He, he said his wife thinks he has a gambling problem because he comes to Lang City. So, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, but of course that was that was just a joke. Uh, he is he was, in my opinion, uh, the best attorney general that we've had in New Jersey, and I think a lot of people uh, agree with that opinion. Not because it's my opinion, but because of what he did, uh, the way he reached out, uh, the way he uh, showed passion and concern about social justice and inclusion and making the legal system work for all people and trying to bridge the gap uh, between law enforcement and community. He absolutely did that. Uh, and I said in, in, in my presentation, that I think he's broken the mold for what attorney generals, how they look, how they speak, how they act uh, and how they perform. And uh, I'm looking for Mr. Brooke uh, in his own way uh, to uh, expand upon those things. Uh, and uh, he will be our guest, Mr. Brock, that is, uh, on August 3rd, first Tuesday in August. We're looking forward to him, Mr. Brock. Andrew Brock is the interim attorney general, and he will be uh, our uh, five o'clock guest uh, then. So, yeah. Londa. We welcome uh, Attorney General Brock to our next week conversation. But also, we want to special, send a special thank you to the executive director of community engagement. And that is Bryn Whittle. So thank you for all the work that you do behind the scenes, uh, working with the Office of the Attorney General and all that you do around New Jersey as well. Yolanda, let me just say this. I'm glad you said that. Uh, there was a meeting uh, the day before the community walk in Trenton, leaders around the state uh, and um, the Attorney General uh, then gave a, a really a farewell address. And at that farewell address before he closed, he mentioned that, uh, uh, Deputy Attorney General Bryn Whittle, our good friend and director of community engagement, was getting a raise uh, and uh, a, a bigger title, much deserved. Uh, she's been on our program, it's listening on our program. She's been on my public uh, safety seminar uh, that I do as, my, as a council person in Atlantic City. And she is a sister beloved. And I said that she is a HSIC which means head sister in charge. And she laughs about that, but she is a very capable professional. And uh, she uh, has done a great, great job in the Attorney General's office. And Attorney General Brooke uh, 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 values her as, as part of the, the team that's going to make uh, justice better in New Jersey. Absolutely. Right. Ms. Willow, you're a superstar. So thank you for all that you do. Right. So, President, you've asked me to do something very special for this show. As most of our audience knows, we will be having a convention coming one year from now. And our team members with Meet AC, so we are in partnership not only with the state of New Jersey State Conference of the NAACP, but also our Tourism Bureau, which is affectionately known 
and uh, actually known as MEAT-AC, and the CRDA has been mentioned as, as President Kaleem Shabazz mentioned earlier. Those are all of our team partners as we spearhead our efforts to July of 2022. And so they've put together a special video a vignette of uh, discussion points that we have as NAACP members spoken about the importance of the NAACP coming to Atlantic City. So with your permission, I'd like to show that and let's discuss. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. And you can give a few remarks as I put it up on the screen. Okay. Uh, we are super excited about the convention because we have, uh, I believe, our, uh, not our ace in the hole, but our value added. Uh, Meet Atlantic City, their job is to attract uh, visitors uh, through conventions and seminars and activities like that. Uh, they were a partner early on in our effort to get the national convention here. Uh, they went out with us uh, to Detroit uh, two years ago to make a presentation to the Time and Place Committee. Uh, and they uh, also hosted uh, the National Board of Directors uh, for the NACP in the fall of that year. And people are still talking about that, Yolanda, how much they enjoyed Atlantic City. Uh, and uh, we just thank them. And I'm sure that together we're gonna to have a dynamic, spirit-filled, information-filled, uh, conference in Atlantic City in 2022. So without further ado, we will have the presentation video and everyone can listen on the radio to our introduction to Atlantic City to the National Board of Directors of the NAACP. Hello, I'm Sandy Harvey, Vice President of Sales for Meet AC. And I'm Laura Terrero, Multicultural National Sales Manager for Meet AC. On behalf of Atlantic City, we look forward to hosting you at our seaside destination. Here's a preview of everything you will enjoy while attending the NAACP National Convention. I'm super excited to see the NACP come to Atlantic City because Atlantic City has a historical link to the civil rights struggle here in America. Atlantic City is the place where Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's really coming full circle in the struggle for civil rights. We go all the way back to 1955 when the uh, NAACP National Convention was here in Atlantic City. I think it's long overdue for the NAACP National Convention to return to Atlantic City, New Jersey. I know Atlantic City will welcome the NAACP with open arms and be glad that uh, so many people from around the country get to see the changes that we've been making here. And I'm just glad to be part of that. As a former president of the school board here in Atlantic City, um, I do see that as a tremendous opportunity. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties on the, on the video. Okay. Well, uh, I think we got halfway through it. Uh, the, the idea was to show the video uh, that Meet Atlantic City has done. It's going to be shown. Uh, in fact, it was shown, uh, I believe, today to the uh, National Convention uh, as they conclude uh, the National Convention that was uh, supposed to be in Charlotte, uh, but it was virtual. Uh, so they are ge gearing up. Uh, and we are gearing up uh, for the uh, National Convention for next year, 2022. Uh, and for those of you, uh, you can see the complete video. I think it's going to be on our NACP platforms. Is that correct, Yolanda? That is correct. So it's going to be, we'll upload it to our YouTube, we'll upload it to our Facebook, and we'll upload it to our Twitter. Okay, so uh, all of those social media uh, platforms, you'll be able to see that. And hopefully, uh, maybe next week uh, at our 4.30 hour, we can try to play it again. Uh, for the, so the radio audience can listen to it. And so people who might not have a chance to get on the platform can see it. It's a very impressive video. 
uh, again, I feel that with the added dimension of Need AC helping push the convention, I think we're going to have the biggest convention ever. Also, the fact that the convention last year in Boston had to be virtual because of the virus. This year in Charlotte, North Carolina, had to be virtual because of the virus. I think people will be ready to come to Atlantic City to come together uh, to see uh, and, and discuss the various uh, issues uh, related to civil rights and social justice that the NACP uh, does. We're planning some very special features we hope to announce. Uh, we we want to have a, a parade, a welcoming parade. Uh, we want to have the uh, Universal Soul Circus and some other special activities. And, and, and like we said in Detroit, it's impossible to have a bad time in Atlantic City. Even if you want to, you can't have a bad time in Atlantic City. And we're going to pull out all the stops. I am happy to say, Yolanda, happy to report uh, to people as we're coming closer, as we're a year out and looking forward, that we have the united support of the city administration, of the city council, of the county administration, of the business community, of the civic community, of the religious community of Atlantic City and surrounding areas. Everybody is pumped up. Uh, everybody is working uh, together and everybody's expecting a great, great convention. So I'm excited about 2022 in Atlantic City uh, for the national convention. Uh, I'm excited about the prospects of having a very, very big uh, convention. And, and really for our coming events, uh, our annual MLK program, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have our walk, uh, if the virus allows it, uh, that we'll be able maybe to have a hybrid program, have it uh, in St. James and also on the radio or on Zoom, uh, since we have you and uh, Natasha Davis, our social media team and the other people who are so proficient in doing this and uh, looking forward to our second annual radio sign again uh, on uh, WHA and uh, also looking forward to hopefully having our in-person Freedom Fund breakfast in April and uh, recognizing the people that we wanted to recognize in 2019 that we couldn't because of the virus. Uh, and I think 2022 is going to be a great year. Uh, and, and we're looking for great big things from the NACP. And, and, and also uh, your next gen uh, leadership as, as a national president looking for young people all over the country to come to Atlantic City uh, in July of 2022, enjoy the city and uh, uh, make great plans uh, as, as future NACP leaders. And uh, also uh, talk up Atlantic City. It's going to be, it's going to be great. That's right. uh, looking forward to it. Okay. Oh, by the way, did you get your special president from the Meet AC team to deliver to your home? Oh, I wanted to say, I, I sure did. I got that. I was so excited to, to get that. I think that is going, that, that shows the benefit. I don't know how, what other cities did. I can't imagine that they have done what Meet AC did. I, I don't know what they did, but I can't imagine. Uh, Meet AC has went over and aboard above. Uh, they have been uh, extreme professionals. One day we're going to find out from uh, Sandy Harvey how she got the whispers to give a shout out to Atlantic City in the show at uh, Golden Nugget. I still don't know how she did that. Uh, maybe we'll never know, but we know it happened. Uh, and the national board people are still, I know some of your uh, next gen people are talking about it. We had two shows. Uh, they had what the Isley Brothers, yeah. and the Pointer Sisters, and then the next show, the next night was the uh, Whispers. So, uh, outstanding. Harvey and Laura are just super, and I think that is going to that with the national uh, push and the things that uh, we're going to do uh, with our committee. I think it's going to make us very successful in the convention. Absolutely. So we want to thank Sandy Harvey, Louis Herrera, Lisa Doyle, and the rest of the Meet AC team for what they've done over this national convention virtually for the 112th National Convention and what, the, what they'll be doing next year in 2022 for the 113th convention held right here in Atlantic City. And what I was mentioning to the, to the president was that uh, Meet AC sent us all VIP boxes right. to introduce the national board as well as esteemed VIP members of the national NAACP 
to give them a token of appreciation of what to look forward to. So there was some taffy in there. There's a, a tourist guide. It was a lip um, balm that I'm using lip my lip balm. balm. Yeah. Just fun and sun that we're not just casinos. Right. We are beachside views. We're family fun entertainment. And we are going to be civil rights advocates in 2022. So looking forward to that. Thank you, Me Day C. Yeah. We appreciate it. Uh, we have four minutes. Do you have any announcements, uh, Yolanda, before we go to our guest the five o'clock hour? Absolutely. So I want to encourage everyone who is not yet a member of the NAACP, you can become a member of the Atlantic City branch two ways. You can send your name, address, email address, and phone number with your correspondence to the Atlantic City NAACP PO Box 1182 at Seekin, New Jersey 08201. Or you can go to www.naacp.org forward slash become a member. Our zip code is 08401. But we're also known as Unit 2077B, the Atlantic City Branch. And an annual membership for an adult is $30. But if you know a young person who wants to be a member of our youth council, please reach out to us because we have plenty of youth council memberships available for our young people here in Atlantic City. We also want to encourage everyone, please register to vote if you're not registered. If you know someone who wants to register, he or she must be a US citizen, at least 17 years of age, although he or she may not vote until 18, has to be a resident of your county for at least 30 days prior to the election. And so long as he or she is not incarcerated, meaning that he or she could serve, be currently serving on probation or parole here in New Jersey and can be registered to vote. So that's over 80,000 New Jerseyans who are currently under conditions of probation or parole who can vote. So please register and the deadline is nearing but the deadline to register to vote is at least 21 days prior to election day. And with that, I don't have any announcements other than please register to vote and please join the NAACP in our efforts as we move to 2022. Rhonda, thank you so much. Let me just say we announce every week against COVID-19 virus, please, please get your uh, vaccination. It's accessible, it's free, it's effective. And we encourage everyone uh, to get registered, and not get registered, yeah, to register, of course, uh, and also to get your vaccination. October 24th and 25th is our annual NAACP Candidates Night. We don't tell you who to vote for, we encourage you to vote, and we have the Democratic and the Republican candidates. We give them a platform to present themselves to the uh, public. Uh, every year we do this, we do it twice. We do it before the primary in June. We do it before the general election in October. And we've been doing that uh, ever since uh, my administration and uh, Yolanda and uh, others are very helpful uh, in putting that on. And we'll probably do a hybrid this year, uh, maybe in person and on Zoom, uh, if the conditions allow. If not, we'll do it just on Zoom, but we will bring it uh, to the public October 24th and October 25th. Very important gubernatorial election, state senate election, state assembly election, county commissioner election, and right here in Atlantic City, election for mayor and three council people at large. Uh, you need to know the issues. You need to get involved in them. As we say on city council, vote your conscience, uh, vote your interests, uh, vote your concerns, but, but do vote. And uh, our job as the NACP is to provide you that form. And I'm happy to report last year, we had thousands of viewers, people who tuned in uh, to, uh, actually on the night of and uh, going forward. And since this year, we're gonna have early voting. It's very important that uh, you listen. We had a five o'clock hour, Yolanda, and we have as our special guest, uh, Minister Roy L. Jones, who I'm, I'm happy to report uh, is a native of Atlantic City, born in Atlantic City. Now he's come back full circle. He is a, uh, I don't wanna say an activist, that doesn't do, uh, give credit to the scope of what he has done and continues to do. I like to say he's an environmental organizer, one of his many hats uh, in a very, very important topic. As you know, Yolanda is one of the uh, game changers. NACP is involved in the environment, environmental justice, uh, training people for environmental leadership. And I wanted to have him on uh, to tell people uh, the importance of the environment and tell him what he has done. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Yolanda who will take us into the next uh, segment of the program. Good afternoon, Minister Jones. We are so glad to have you with us this afternoon. 
for our for our show. You have an extensive, impressive resume, and I will ask our social media chair to post it on the on the website because I can't do it justice by reading everything. But I want to give a few highlights mm -hmm. of your bio, and then we'll go to the first question, which will be: Please tell us three things about you that are not on this bio. So, Minister Jones, are you ready to to talk with us? I'm ready. Uh, thanks a lot, Yolanda and Councilman Shabazz. Uh, it's a pleasure just to uh, be a part of this program. I've listened to you guys on other um, days and I'm excited. But you know what? Uh, the, the Atlantic City NACP is, probably has the most progressive and dynamic NACP, I think, in the country, frankly. Uh, I don't know any other towns that are doing, have their own uh, talk show and just keeping people informed. So I'm, I'm just uh, thrilled to be a part of this and, and to give you uh, some of my information that I can uh, bring before the people. So, so just to back up a minute, uh, probably one thing that a person would know about me is that I grew up during the heyday of the Kentucky Avenue Renaissance. <laughs> and I can see it in my dream. I can, I can see it in my dreams. I can, I can still taste that uh, chicken on Kentucky Avenue. And <laughs> it, was, it was just exciting, man. You know, it was exciting. The other thing uh, your viewers and listeners may not know is that I, I, I'm a Southern transplant. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. I came to Atlantic City around 1956, 57. And uh, of course, I, I knew nothing about snow, <laughs> I experienced snow. So the first snow, I was, I went whole wild crazy. <laughs> I was just sledding, doing my angel move and everything else. So uh, the other thing is in the, in the South, there was no such thing as a hoagie. <laughs> it, was, it was a sandwich called the Dagwood. So the best thing, and, and it, it went to a cartoon character named Dagwood. But anyway, the Dagwood was a sandwich with about three pieces of bread, all kinds of meat, no lettuce, tomato, onion, peppers, everything. That's, that was it. So when I came to Atlantic City and I experienced the uh, White House sub shop steak, hoagie, however you want to sub, however you want to do it. By the, by the way, it was 35 cents then, Yolanda. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that was, I, I, I think I got that right, Akli. Yeah, I but, think so, 35 yeah, cents. 35 cents, so I, I think um, I have one every day. <laughs> On my way back from school, I was stop. I was, <laughs> so I was, I was like completely enthralled with the, um, the White House sub shot. So man, it was, I still frequent the White House sub shot. <laughs> and, I, and I just, all the people that I know, I hiked the uh, sub shop, and uh, so those are some things that people wouldn't know about me. I'm a foodie, so everywhere I go, everywhere I, I travel, I, I, I look for the best in food that I can find. So I know all of the major African American food stops from Atlantic City to Atlanta, Georgia. Everyone. <laughs> I mean, I know everyone. So there's some very dynamic. Uh, African American restaurants on the way down south. So anyhow, those are some of the things that people may not know. I, I am a 1965 graduate of Atlantic City High School. So Yolanda, that was before your time, and uh, <laughs> you know you was, right. probably, you was probably in grade school or maybe just just getting, just you know getting formated, uh, <laughs> formatted. You know, follow me. But anyway, uh, appreciate this time to talk with you guys and just to uh, be a part of this program. Certainly, so we might have to take your tips, your special recommendations for oh. best food between here and Atlanta, and Atlanta. Georgia. Yeah, yeah a, exactly. a, a future interview. Oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so, Minister Jones told us a lot about himself, but I wanna highlight a few things from his bio, mm -hmm. from his extreme experience as an environmental advocate. Mr. Minister Jones has a BA from Rutgers University, an MA from Glassboro State College, also known as Rowan U University, and an MS in Business and Community Economic Development from Southern New Hampshire University and doctoral work from Temple University in Urban Education and Mass Communication. 
He is most proud to have re received a certification as a senior environmental fellow. While at Southern New Hampshire University, he received a, a U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, fellowship. Mm -hmm. In May 2016, Mr. Jones received the Distinguished Rutgers Chancellor's Award for Outstanding Community Civic Engagement Initiatives. He has also helped organize and host many des desegregation higher education conferences and exhibits in partnership with Rutgers University administrators. As a freshman at Rutgers in 1967, Minister Jones, along with six other students, set in motion advocacy that led to the desegregation of the University Rutgers University Camden campus and was part of a coalition that supported university-wide desegregation. His civil rights work continued with the city's Black People's Unity Movement in the late, late 1960s and continues civic engagement and environmental justice work today. He has an extensive civil rights and environmental justice leadership background that covers over 49 years. In 2010, Minister Jones was among 10 people nominated by the Philadelphia Inquirer as Person of the Year for his civil rights advocacy and pioneering that successfully led to the conservation of Petty's Island, the largest urban island in the Delaware Valley area. After Hurricane Sandy in 2002, 2012, excuse me, Minister Jones organized two FEMA townhouse meetings to process and educate citizens about health effects from storms and funding support for those who could not process online ap applications. And in 2014, Minister Jones again held an environmental justice seminar about Atlantic City's vulnerabilities to climate change and storm surges. And he made a presentation before the C Casino Reinvestment Development Authority, also known as CRETA, about the critical need to rebuild Atlantic City and protect vulnerable environmental justice populations affected by Hurricane Sandy in June 2014. He currently serves as, as a facilitator trainer at the Rutgers University Future Scholars Program and has worked in university-based outreach programs for over 23 years. Minister Jones, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, thank you. Let, let me you start know? off just by saying, Yolanda, uh, that uh, one of the reasons I got in trouble at Rutgers University was falling behind <laughs> Roy Jones and Malik Chaka. Oh, man. Camden, and I was in Rutgers, New Brunswick. But uh, right. when the history of Rutgers is written, uh, mm -hmm. Roy Jones, Malik Chaka, and several others will be listed as real change makers. And I salute you uh, and um, uh, applaud your your leadership and your 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 uh, activism. Let me ask you this though: Tell our mm -hmm. audience, uh, Brother Jones, about the toxic site in Camden, the history of that, and where uh, what's the update with that site that you've been working on for a while. Okay, great. Um, so in terms of background, there's a one block area in Camden in an area called Bourbon Square. And there, there's a six story high uh, massive dirt pile of contaminated dirt, debris, uh, tires and other junk. Uh, that you could th uh, throw into a, a landfill, frankly. So the, the problem with it is it's is smack in the middle of a neighborhood. Mm. It is uh, literally one block long, six stories high. And this uh, site has been threatening the health and safety of residents in that area. And so uh, uh, one of the men that own a, own a property there came to me and said, listen, man, I, I need your involvement. I need the people to know what's going on. Uh, I was familiar with it, but I don't generally go into areas unless the community call me into areas. So I made a point of just doing what I do from an environmental justice standpoint. But uh, I, I made a point to organize a press conference about two and a half weeks ago. And uh, we held a press conference. It, it was in the rain at first, uh, you know, I was kind of hesitant about doing the press conference in the rain. And so I got my largest umbrella and stood out in the rain. Some other people got their umbrellas. And the, and the, the miracle of the rain was this, that the pile started to leak and flood onto the sidewalks in the street and then the, the, the properties on three sides of the dirt, uh, a massive dirt pile. So literally, all of the uh, TV media had a shot of their lives in terms of just being able to see visually how impactful this contaminated dirt was. And so it was, it was raining, it was flooding, and, and, the, and the, the dirt 
uh, contaminated dirt was literally flowing into the, the storm water drains. So uh, for those that don't know that if contaminated substances get into you, your sewers and, and there's some nasty stuff in there anyway, but it could ultimately get into your groundwater and affect the quality of water in that area. Now, on a bad hot day, on a severe hot day, the, there's something called fugitive dust. And those dust particles, some are microscopic, some are not, some can, you can physically see. So on a very hot day, and you know how hot it's been so far this summer, uh, people are breathing in toxic substances from that site. So there's a, a when we read the uh, Attorney General's report, they referenced a soil sample, they did 10 soil samples of the massive dirt pile. So this is what they found. They found that uh, in particular, lead, mercury, and there's a, 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 a toxic substance called, um, the short version is P-A-H. And I'm, I'm gonna try to pronounce that as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Mm. Now, this uh, toxic substance can cause liver and pancreatic cancers, and it affects the, the unborn, uh, it, it affects pregnant women, it affects people who have asthma, and it severely affects young, young children. So um, most people don't realize that as adults, uh, we have, a, we have a, a more mature system to fight off toxins, but as it relates to children, their system is still developing. So anything that attacks a child's system can destroy that child, can ultimately have a long-term effect on that child. Um, as adults, we can detoxify, we can take uh, extreme measures, and wear masks and that sort of thing. But you know how children are. Uh, they, they'll walk past a pile, maybe stick their hand in the dirt and you know they're, they're contaminated. So, but with a child, a child has no uh, physiological systems uh, mature enough to fight off toxins. So when they are exposed with lead, mercury, and this other substance, it can affect them for the rest of their lives. And once lead get into the systems of a child, you can really never get it out. The best you can hope for is to test that child early and to try to do some intervention th steps. But if you don't catch it, it grows. It grows first, it, it, it gets into your blood system. Then later, it'll get into your bone marrow system. And, uh, people don't realize either either that uh, lead causes aggressive and violent behavior. So uh, I had, did a, a tour one time with the Smartmore College students, and uh, we, we talked about health effects, and we talked about chemicals that can destroy you and is cancer-causing, but they did not realize that violent behavior uh, from lead exposure, young men and young women could end up uh, uh, engaging in violent behavior because of the toxic substances that's in their body. So a lot of times we see young people uh, on the corners uh, doing their drug bit and, and you know, older adults as well. But you have to look back as to why is it that they could not maneuver into vocations and good jobs and many of them were affected by the contaminant, the level, a high level of contamination in Camden from birth. First, so I could even talk, Yolanda, about, uh, and I, I have to tell you, or just, I'm going to come back to the, this contaminated dirt, but uh, a couple of years ago, we, we found out that of Camden's 32 schools, every day for 350 days out of the year, or a little bit less, these kids were drinking that poison water, literally drinking it. All schools? All 32 schools. Not I have to share this. The national standard for lead poisoning, as you, if you measure it, is what they call 12 parts per billion. So I want you to keep that standard in mind. So if it's 12 parts per billion, it's a poison. So guess what the average for the Camden 32 schools were? 78 parts per billion nearly 
five times what the national standard for, was for lead poisoning. But the most, and that was tragic, but the most tragic thing was there was a school called the ECDC school. Now this is a school where these kids are already, they already come in challenged. It was for kids that came from parents that were addicted or crackheads or alcoholics. The kids were already, already he could not, I mean, educationally challenged. So every morning they would drink what I would call a toxic cocktail, literally drink it every day. And so once we, now this school, uh, Councilman Yolanda, the measurement of lead poisoning as a measurement was 480 parts per billion. So imagine if the standard for lead poisoning is 12 parts per billion, and this school has 480 parts per million documented, what do you think the health effects, the ed educational effects, the social effects from that has been on these children who are already sick now? They're already sick. They're already educationally challenged. And then every morning they were exposed to this toxic uh, substance in, in the water that they drink. So uh, I have to tell you a little bit more about that. This, this, that particular school was so bad, the school started to sink because the school was built on a contaminated site, on a dump site near Parkside. The, the school was built on a dump site. And so the school started to sink. So what happened was when it started to sink, the, 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 the foundation started to crack and mercury would show up along the borders of uh, classroom floors. So they, they shut the school down, they had to demolish the school, and then they, they rebuilt the school. But in the process of rebuilding the school, the construction workers, every day, they would go out and their boots would be, be eaten up by some substance. And they found out that um, there was 10,000 parts per million of toxic substances that could literally eat through metal boots. And the school, they eventually uh, rebuilt the school and remediated the site. But imagine rebuilding a new school on a former contaminated site. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And in, in the world of environmental uh, remediation, the state never cleaned up a site totally. They only clean up it partially. In other words, they'll clean up to about six feet of the dirt and contamination. But if it was built on a landfill, the contamination goes down probably 100 feet or more. So eventually, as it rains and storms, as it rains and storms, this same school site is going to start experiencing issues with its foundation. So that's some of the work that I was doing. But it goes back to this issue of how, um, how much people are affected by contamination uh, of its air, water, and soil in the city of Camden. And now this massive, and I'm gonna stress that, imagine a whole city block of contaminated dirt in, in the middle of a neighborhood. Smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood. And that's, that's the situation in Camden. I got involved with it and uh, there is some new news um, uh, but the media pretty much uh, had a frenzy, uh, you know, taking phot photoshops of the site and just seeing what they saw for the first time that they, they couldn't even imagine that another human being would do that to a community of humans. So uh, anyway, I I'll stop there in, in case you have some other questions, but uh, there are some new news and I can go, I can share that with you as well. Well, well, could you do it? Does it look like it's, it's going to be an effort to clean it up or is it going to remain? Uh, what What is the well, situation of that? That was okay. a chilling report that you gave. Okay. It's, in fact, it was bone chilling. And, and if you if you drive by it and you take photos yourself, it, it's unimaginable that, it, that that's happening in the, in the neighborhood. But anyway, the new news is this. The state attorney general went back into court to file an injunctive relief uh, brief to compel 
the cleanup of the site and, and uh, compel the owners to put together a plan in 10 days to clean up the site. So there's seven things that this brief is advocating. And I, I'm just gonna share some of them. The first thing is the immediate removal of the solid waste, dust and debris that migrates from the site into residential property. So they are gonna literally remove all 70,000 tons or more of this contaminated dirt within the next month. Hmm. Then the second thing is that they're gonna repair and restore the fencing that surrounds the site. Now, I want you to imagine this viewers, that this massive six story pile of dirt has a thin, fading, worn out fence that protects it from the neighborhood. The fence is probably 15 years old. Hmm. It's decaying. You can see breaks in the fence, but it's supposed to be protecting the power from the neighborhood and protecting hmm. homeowners from this, this debris. So they, they're, gonna, they're requiring that, that new fencing be put up, the site be cleaned up, and when they, they also are compelling them to remove all the uh, dirt and debris that's in this, on the sidewalks, that's on the streets and on the road, on the roadways and public rights of way in the neighborhood, on all four corners surrounding this block. And then uh, a, a fourth thing is this. In the meantime, they want the, the, the contaminated debris uh, and massive dirt pile stabilized. And because potentially if, there, if a Northeaster happened, there could be a mudslide. Hmm. So anybody, now imagine you're living 30, I'm sorry, 50 feet from this, this massive dirt pile, just 50 feet now on all three corners. Hmm. So if it rains real hard and floods, it's a potential that the, the pile, well, the, the dirt pile is unstable. And they have taken pictures to show that the dirt pile is completely unstable. At any point, it could collapse into the street and it could also overflow and, and, and literally uh, create a landslide against people's properties, and maybe kill, harm, and hurt people in the process. Because it's not like homes are a block away from the site. They're 50 feet away from the site on four different corners. Hmm. They park their cars near it. Their cars are near the site than their homes. So if there was a mudslide or a landslide, it would affect everybody. So the, the state is requiring that this uh, dirt pile, and that's too soft of a word, massive dirt pile be stabilized. Hmm. Now, what they should have been do, doing, uh, Yolanda and Councilman, is that they should have put tarps over the soil, right. prevent it from uh, uh, dust and debris, uh, you know, flying into people's homes, people breathing it in. So imagine for three, at least three years, this pile has been uncovered. Hmm. So we've went through some miles, sort of northeasters. We've had major flooding in Camden, and Camden is a town that. Uh, also is prone to major flooding. And so the flooding alone ha can have a, a, a major impact on the water quality, but the, 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 rain, the heavy rainfall can also destabilize the, uh, the massive dirt pile even further and cause a landslide. So those are the things that uh, the state just went into court, by the way, just yesterday. So it's new news uh, in major papers and, and some of the uh, TV breaking. stations are covering, it, but it is breaking news. Yes. So now, as important as that is, we can't give them any good marks around it because, frankly, that's their job. Right. It's the job of the DEP and the county health department to protect the health and safety of residents. So if you're just doing your job, I cannot give you a high grade 
you know, you just basically you get a C for doing your job. Mm. But in this case, it's a job that they're doing late in the game. I mean, three years late into the game. So one of the, uh, I don't want to go too far ahead of myself, but so one of the things that we're playing is a class action lawsuit as well. Because mm. uh, as a lawyer, Yolanda, you know this, right? Now the plaintiffs, guess what? In the, in the lawsuit, the citizens are not the plaintiffs. Mm. The state is. Mm. So all of the remedies ultimately will help residents, but there are some remedies that have been completely left out. So therefore, there's a need for a class action lawsuit and that will demand several things. Uh, air quality testing, mm. air, water quality testing in the area, health screening testing for residents, especially children. And then because the residents were not able, been able to sell their homes, what kind of uh, support would they get because they're stuck there? They can't sell it. They can't move. Mm. Poor from Jump Street. And so what should they get out of this other than removing this dirt pile? Which is important now, but it's, it's late in the game. The bird has already left the coop three years ago. It's, it's important that, so in the next, uh, as a follow-up, in the next several weeks, we're gonna be calling for a class action what, we're going to do a town meeting, and then we're going to discuss whether residents want to do their own class action also. So that's the, that's the latest news. This is all jaw dropping. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brother Roy, I am not often at a loss for words, but I, this is stunning, right. uh, horrible. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I tell you what, we have two minutes left. We're going to have to bring you back in okay. August for an update because we yes, have sir. other questions, okay. but we didn't get to it. Okay. If it wasn't you, I would say, mm -hmm. Yolanda, please check this gentleman out and make sure mm -hmm. that he's not a conspiracy theorist or a crackpot <laughs> or something like I mean, because right. it sounds unbelievable yeah. to tell oh, somebody yeah. that in a city in New Jersey, <laughs> That is a, a six story high block long pile of toxic material. I mean, that's yes, sounds like a, 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 not a fairy tale, a horror story. Yeah, but it's horror really, story. Yeah, it's. it's yeah, one minute left. You want to make a, a final statement in 30 seconds, and I promise you, we're going to bring you back next month to give us an yes. update. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, real quick. Right. Uh, that was just the tip of the iceberg. Right. So, if you do what they call an environmental profile of the city of Camden. Right. This is what you'll find. You'll find 115 other contaminated sites. Oh my goodness. 115. Camden have more contaminated sites probably in all seven counties in South Jersey, in one city. Hmm. And by the way, it has a regional sewage treatment plant. So if you, camp, you come to Camden on a very hot day, mm -hmm. smell the sewage from county residents, suburban residents, 450,000 residents that flush their toilet every day, three times a day, their sewage comes to Camden. I want you to imagine what it smells like. Man. Junkyards and all other kinds of facilities that uh, pollute the air, water, and soil. And so the, this dirt, this massive dirt pile is just a tip of the iceberg. But uh, when you look at the, at the totality of the city and the environmental degradation that the city is facing, it is it's more than a horror story. Okay. And this story needs to be told. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to bring you back in August for an yes, update, sir. for a follow-up. We appreciate you, brother. Uh, mm -hmm. Keep on fighting. Uh, that's what we say when mm -hmm. we close out every program. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Mm -hmm. You have been listening to Minister Absolutely. Roy Jones, a mm -hmm. environmental activist, battler, and organizer. Thank you. Tune in next week. Yolanda, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you so much.